All right, just had a slight break. Uh, let's go into our next round of demos here. That goes into our uh, following reference shot, the new layer. And uh, we'll study this guy up here. It's not the re best reference photograph in terms of quality, but I do like the posing. Uh, so with this one, we'll just kind of first just analyze the form in, in the angle that we have it here right now. Uh, like I said, I'm going to just first plan out the torso. We do see a twisting action from center of his uh, kind of pit of the neck. Of course, joints, you find the center line towards the other side of the torso. So looking for that twisting action, okay, is something that you need to be obviously be aware of when it comes to some of the poses in the future, especially in terms of more dynamic posings. So here with this one, initially, I'm going to go with uh, a little rougher version. Let's do a top line, center line. This way first, and wrapping around this direction, twisting that torso, getting that side plane, top portion down to the hips. Again, midsection gonna be right about here. So from that region, let's attach the legs. We can't necessarily see the lower portion of the groin, but we can attach the legs going forward this way. Well, the arms, this one, the shoulders is behind. When the arm comes down this direction. Now we can't really see a lot of information based on the reference photograph because the clothing covers it a lot. I can see where his right hand is. So I can basically estimate the position of uh, elbows and arm based on that aspect. Um, and sometimes you can also then, you know, basically kind of go by um, adjustments of your own. So if you want to reposition some things because it's going to be a better designed image, uh, compared to what, what's actually being given from the photograph, you can do so. Let's go out to the hand, head up in this direction. Other leg is coming behind, knees going down. Just seeing it where it compares to the, the uh, left leg, goes back that direction. So again, stick figure essentially is what you're drawing. Um, as we have built that figure out, let's go into building the forms. And imagine that um, Ken doll figure with the torso or the lower portion of the hips where the thighs will connect. Cross contour turns this way. Down to the knee. As we go back upwards, ankle's going to sit right about there. And the feet will be obviously a planes and shapes. Place in our upper arms, comes up this direction, trapezius area split up where the chest region is going to be from here. Cross contour towards as it turns to the camera, as you have the hand coming out, turn it into a, a shape and plane, grouping these together like fingers. They don't have to be drawn individually at this point just yet. Cross contour. We have the figure in the position, the pose that we want. As I look at things like, uh, again, the ends of the hands from the angle from there, position of the knee. Uh, again, looking at these kind of appendages and endpoints and seeing as an overall shape of how things are kind of linking up and does it look appropriate to what I've just drawn as well too, right? So as I draw through the internal of the form, find those positions. You could be doing this preemptively as well too, having those landmarks in place to kind of connect together. You just kind of see if they're in proper alignment and positioning from the hand going down vertically, see where that attaches to the thigh section, the space in between that as a negative. 
obviously the angle of the overall torso and the heel going up to the back of the head pretty close but so far again like i said it seems okay in terms of what we're going for um that kind of thing of course of course of uh deconstruction not deconstruction but constructions all those elements is uh, not going to be so natural at times when you're doing it uh, you'll kind of forget about you know the idea of linking from one point to another one uh looking for alignment points and seeing where they relate to each other but with practice of course hopefully that will get a bit stronger now this pose of course is a bit more challenging based on the fact that he has a lot more torsion um you know his hands are kind of out a little bit and legs are in different positions as well too so um you know it's going to require a bit more um like i said of a, of a moment to either thumbnail or to figure out like what exactly is going to be going on in other of these shots. I put a plan in there just for his like foot placement, uh, just to kind of show you that you know there's something there for his contact point to be placed in. Let's try from a different angle of view, and uh, if anything, I'm going to shrink this one down a little bit here, real quickly. And we'll do another study real fast, from a different angle, and then I'm going to do uh, a larger piece over here, which will be the Batman piece, okay? Um, let's see. Try it now, before I even move forward, I'm just basically looking at the pose and just in my head visualizing uh, what first, which angle of you do I want it from? I can't just randomly just choose because you can also end up coming to a point where you, you choose a shot where you either just do it by um, immediate decision, not really thinking it through, or of course you can assume and that's just due to the experience. And, and that's not to say that you won't run into this and I certainly hope you do, actually, because that chance of problem solving has to arise. But in this moment, I don't want to make a hasty decision of saying, I, I just want an up angle shot. Well, we kind of have an up angle shot. Well, I could do a down angle shot. Well, I could do that as well, too. Um, you can turn the camera and move it from a different rotation. Those are the actions. So I'm thinking of first the camera movement actions that I have. Rotation, down, or up. Now we have a down. I can go level. That means I can bring the camera up to us, maybe the level of where he is, height-wise. I can go above him. I can rotate it more to the left or to the right. So as I do so, I think about maybe what's going to be the most um, interesting, but also one that's not going to be overly challenging just yet, because I just want to get warmed up to this still. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is go into a shot that goes up a little bit higher and turning the camera to the left. And as I do so, I'm trying to picture like the way the, the body is going to be coming towards or away from the camera that is. So again, because we have something that's so dynamic of posing, um, having a chance first to just think about it and, and seeing where certain landmarks, but also focusing on something every area of some specifics. Torso. Right now, I'm looking at his torso and looking at the version I just I drew. And if I then lifted my camera and turned it to the left, what would that torso just look like? Just that alone. Don't worry about the entirety of the pose itself. Just establish a focus on one section. Just the torso alone can be good enough. For some people, like I said, they might need something else. But for me, all I want is just the torso now. So if I move the camera over uh, up and to his left-hand side, going this direction, looking in, um, what we're going to want, let's do a small little version of it down here, is his upper torso facing away, coming towards. This direction but you know what i'm going to turn it even more we'll turn it more this direction you'll have it coming towards the camera the hips will be faced this direction and this is going to be the pillowcase which halfway point down to the groin section there But I also know that his body is leaning away from the camera now. It's going away from us. So I could have made it more uh, vertical, like this. But then the problem is he doesn't have that lean backwards. So the angle of the top clavicle line is really important here. Okay, This line gave me that chance to also uh, have the form of the plane face away from the camera. So here's that side. Okay, This is going to be the side of his second of the, the hips. As it goes front, this is going to be where his groin is going to be down over here. So the leg is going to come across towards the, the, the wall. So the camera, again, is basically I'm, I'm behind the wall, essentially. Okay. It's going to come up this direction. This other leg is going to be aligned 
with that going this direction back. So his leg, you won't be able to see it as well because it's going to be behind him. This arm's going to be coming towards the wall also, almost as if he's trying to almost, it doesn't look like he's about to touch it, but I'm going to have it actually come out and up. This direction here. The other arm will be going back. And his head up here. Now, you may not be able to see it very well right now based on this gesture and line and shape, um, but as I start to increase the level of form, you'll start to see what I'm seeing. Said there has to be moments of like construction and moving things around and see where it goes. So let that happen and, and draw it maybe in a couple successions. When I say that you're taking one figure and turning it three times, that also might mean that you might have to draw it a couple times in each of those rotations because you're trying to figure out what that thing looks like. So here, as I have the leg coming towards the camera, his foot will be in contact point there. So think of the wall as being like this, or behind the wall. This is the hip area here. I want to see a twist to that a little bit too much of the side plane, more in the front. There's more to this direction. His other leg, like I said, is behind him. So in, in this particular angle of view, uh, you probably would barely see it, but you might actually see a little bit of evidence of it going back this direction. But then, of course, as you look at it, the pose looks a bit awkward. So this I'm also going to design, make executive decisions as to what I want the pose to do. Uh, because we're not seeing the actual angle of view. I don't really know exactly what his right leg positioning is. Uh, I do know that as the hips are being drawn inwardly here, as this leg is going in this direction, uh, he's, he's pushing off of that wall. So as he's rotating his upper torso, this leg is going to come around, basically. So um, it's in mid-motion. So as it's in mid-motion, um, the position of it, it looks a bit awkward because of the motion itself. And if it was stationary, if he was posed, he would have probably put his leg that way. Uh, but because he's trying to create, you know, this rotation off the, the contact point, that's why the leg looks a bit awkward here, which is why it's going to look awkward in this side as well, too. But if I put his leg around over here, which is what he's trying to lift over around, it, it just won't look very good. So I'm going to leave it hidden. This is also the part in which it's really hard to judge, but also let go. You want to show something. Because, you know, well, there's a leg there. If I don't show the leg, well, if I put a leg down here, this is not the pose in which the figure is what he's doing. It doesn't have that same kind of rotational effect. So his leg is bent, you know, completely bent at the knee, lifted to his back heel. So with the torso and his legs up here, it's going to be hidden. It's, it's, you don't see it. So you don't show it. Uh, and that's that part, like I said, which can be hard for, for people. That you want to capture a shot that shows everything, you know? And that's not always going to work because it's actually really not always the best uh, visual outcome. So as his hand comes up this direction over here, this arm is again now pointing away. As you'll see the underside of his head a little bit. And already right here, I would probably do something a little bit different. Uh, to change this, again, you can rework your sketches. It's okay. Uh, I would go back, take his arms, and spread it out backwards more. Because I want his chest to slightly open up. So I would bring this arm forward this direction. His hand is actually, again, facing the wall. So he has a open spread arms. By putting it too close to this positioning, it brought the hands closer together. So I want them to be spread apart that direction.
challenging posing this one. And again, because he's going off of the wall and you don't see that leg, that posing is hard to capture because you want to show more of it to get that silhouette of what you're seeing beforehand. Uh, but certain angle of views will give you more, certain angle of views will give you less. Uh, if I turn the body more, you might get a bit more of that information, but um, sometimes you don't need it. So far, that one, not too bad. Everything's where I need it to be, cross contour turning that way. Turn to the torso is there, angle is there. Um, let's try a more creative shot now. This one, <clears throat> I'm going to go from bottom to a top angle view down. Okay, so let's build the thing first. Well, okay, so there's two ways we can go about this. I can build it for you guys like I'm doing now. Um, and I would prefer to do that way because I don't want to necessarily influence you to say that um, the way I'm going to do it in the other way is the way it should be done. So what I might try to do here is let's do a bit of both. I'm going to go straight in, all right? I'm going to go straight into this one. And so the plan of how I need to kind of build this will alter, okay? It won't be the same as I would do in this situation. But um, if I approach it with the building of the form, I would always do tilt torso first. But in this iteration I'm going to do right now, um, I may not. I may start with something else. Keep in mind the fact that when you go into the side of creatively pushing this pose, if you want to alter the posing a little bit, you know, things like a little bit of like positioning of the head in different directions. Maybe he's looking right instead of left. Um, you know, slightly opening up the hands or instead of closing it. Um, things like that can be incorporated, all right? So I don't want you to completely alter the pose compared to what you actually have, but little minute changes is all right. Okay, so don't feel like you have to be uh, linked and locked to the reference photograph directly. So we're just gonna go straight in there. And I am gonna start with the top of the head. <clears throat> and you know what, before I even do this, right now I'm already starting a little bit too large. I'm gonna shrink it down a little bit because I know I'm gonna, I forgot that I wanted to create the other piece down over here. So I'm not gonna overtake too much of this space. So right now, in my head, I have an idea in terms of the angle of view, but I will say that I don't know what this is going to look like, okay? Uh, it, this could end up working fine, and this could end up being disastrous. Uh, and I have no idea. But based on what I had studied and based on my own experiences of things, I feel like I should be able to problem solve it, and we'll see. When I say I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, I mean, I don't have an actual image in my head as to like what the final outcome really is within this. Um, but to, to, but even within that feeling alone, that doesn't, of course, stop me from being able to attempt it. That's kind of the key thing about this, uh, is that despite how it feels in terms of uh, the feeling of, I don't know what I'm trying to get here, I don't know what this is going to look like, However, it's okay. I have enough information, I have enough of the study to now go off of, which I can now generate my own iteration of this. So I'm gonna have his cape going back this direction. And we're gonna turn his torso this way. with his belt on over here, some of the overlaps, lower portion of the groin, and then we're gonna go into the lower leg and the hips. We do the whole superhero costuming with the underwear. And his hand coming this direction out. Um, I want this to be a bit more slim Batman, a bit more slender, younger version of him type when he was very energetic and flying around instead of the bulkier heavier batman he became uh, which the the movie version today kind of has now uh the newer one actually was pretty good because it was his younger version uh the one with um what the hell's that guy's name 
I can't remember. <laughs> it was pretty good, right? I think I don't know if anybody liked it. I'm talking about the the big bulky one that Ben Affleck played, which was the uh, the Dark Knight Returns version. Pattinson, right? That was his name. I'm gonna take his arm, come forward. Here is show angles. I'm gonna have it where his hands were uh, out, as if he was maybe even throwing something. Uh, off topic question what's the size of my canvas? Uh, it's pretty large, actually. I'm working 8 by 14. Okay, so in terms of pixel count, it's 5600 by 3200, 400 resolution. And this is because, again, it's like just so the canvas is large enough for me to draw not just multiple pieces, but in high enough resolution to show you guys in up close details. But also, if I import images of, let's say, homework, uh, some people's homework sizes are gigantic, some of them are a little bit small, but I have the canvas size to, to adjust it, move it. That's really the reason why I chose that size. But uh, typically, when I do my canvas work, or let's say digital work, my, my general sizing dimension wise can can be from A4 and larger, but I always keep it at least at 400 resolution or higher. Or higher, okay? So that's because sometimes in some things I might need to print. And for print, you need in Photoshop, you got to start at 400, okay? Uh, that's standard in printing. So I can procreate files as well, too. Uh, I'll try to go quite large if I can. Um, As I come down this direction, this is being hidden by it, but it's okay. I just draw behind it. The leg is going to come down in contact with the wall. His other leg is going to go behind, and I want to show evidence of it because it is going to be behind him a little bit. But I'm going to blur this much like in the photograph. And we'll play with that a little bit in terms of effect. We'll go off the canvas in terms of the cape. And he'll be thrown off uh, at a range this direction. Yeah, you always want to work high and uh, be able to bring it down. But of course, you know, being mindful of your uh, computer and, and knowing what you can actually do in terms of you know, the level of, of its performance. Um, let's get some of the muscle and definition in there. I'm going to do the bad signal on that. I like the more kind of classical vintage looks of things always. Um, from the films, I am more a fan of the Keaton version because I grew up with it as a kid in the 90s and the 80s. So the original Batman movie from Tim Burton, something I absolutely fell in love with as a kid. There were two movies in my youth that were, uh, you know, completely life altering, I guess, in a way. Uh, it was one was the Batman movie, but the other one was the, uh, the Ninja Turtles movie. Oh, I used to rewatch these films on VHS over and over and over again. It was to the point where I would, as a kid, reenact scenes with my friends because <laughs> we would watch the movies together. Um, so even though I was really into Marvel comics, I was really into the DC movies because that's all there were. There are, I mean, there were Marvel movies back in the day too, uh, back in the 90s. Um, in the 80s, they were pretty terrible, though. You know, of course, the Incredible Hulk TV show was pretty good. Um, but man, there were some movies in Marvel back in the time. Some of you may know of them because you've heard of them, but you probably haven't watched them. But the Roger Corman version of Fantastic Four, that one was notorious back in the 90s. And I've seen it. And I've, I've actually watched it a couple times, actually. Um, the Captain America movie back in the 90s, I used to watch that a lot, too, because I would rent it at the library <laughs> during my youth. Uh, 
that version of Batman was always funny because I'm not Batman, not Batman, but Captain America because he would actually have his ears exposed and he had the little wings on the side of his head. He was like the actual comic book version of it, which is actually pretty cool. Uh, but the guy who played him was so terrible. Um, and then there was the Red Skull that you know uh, that, that, that they had in the movie. But it was so funny with his ears sticking out uh, for Captain America. Well, that was that that was the point in which Marvel films really found themselves, and you know, for, for Blade, it really saved Marvel not only from the film and cinematic work, but also just financially in terms of like their, their comics, because they weren't comics back in the '90s were were odd because it over flooded the market and it kind of died off, and they were struggling. Marvel almost shut down in the '90s. Uh, you know, they they lost a lot of their artists, uh, Jim Lee and guys like that, Todd McFarlane, they left and went into like, you know, their own stuff and Wildstorm. Uh, DC was always going through a rocky period as well, too. But Marvel was, was completely stalled. Uh, they weren't doing well at all. But it wasn't until Blade came out, there was a resurgence of comic book movies. And it was after Blade that all of a sudden it took off. And so that is the movie that really kind of saved uh, Marvel. There's, you know, a lot of information out there actually about that. But... You know, I, I grew up with that one as well, too. And, and this is a time course during high school now. So I'm a teenager watching, you know, like Blade and, and movies like that. But I also grew up uh, in, high, in a high school where it was actually really small. So uh, it was tiny. And most of them were like people that were artists or just kind of the more weird kids, the goth kids, a lot of them as well, too. Um, I was kind of the more the social butterfly. I didn't really have a clique or a social grouping. I kind of the shifted from one to the other quite often. So I would hang out with the ones that were artists, hang out with the ones that were goth kids, and some kids that were like into punk, and some kids that were into sports. I was all over the place. I was kind of friends with everybody, even though I wasn't very vocal. <laughs> I think it was because I was just a quiet kid who just drew all the time. So I was able to mix and match with anybody, really. Um, and I, because I went to a small high school, it really gave me the chance to, you know, obviously do the things I did. I think if I went to a larger public high school, I, I wouldn't have done very well. Um, so I'm glad I went to like one of those magnet high schools, which is what I did. And it was recommended to me by an art teacher from like, you know, grade school and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, that really, I think, put me on my path of being introduced to a lot of people. And of course, that's where I met very close friends and whatnot. And, uh, one of them became a, another successful artist. Uh, we went to Art Center together. Uh, Izzy is his name, Madrano. Um, but yeah, very formative years. In my past, in my, in my look back on like high school, I don't look back on it as a, as a form of like, as a traumatic experience. You know, um, there were times, my high school is high school. And as you're growing through puberty and stuff like that, you have your own things. But I, I don't think it was as bad as like some people that I know that have gone through high school and look at it with complete, just utter disgust. You know, <laughs> they don't even want to remember high school. But I actually liked it quite a bit. Um, you know, I met very good instructors, uh, very lifelong friend people. So for me, it was actually a very positive thing, which is why I feel very fortunate in my educational experience, not only just going through college, but also going through pretty much, you know, education in general uh, as a platform. So um, I had a lot of support, which was good. So here's our version of Batman now. <clears throat> so that pose, again, like I said, is now being uh, affected, of course, influenced by the reference photograph, and I'm using it of course, you know, as close as I can, but I'm also altering a few small things here and there if necessary to uh, benefit the posing of this version, right? Um, from Miguel, your our, our high school art teacher was also cool. Yeah, you also played great music from the 80s. That's awesome. That kind of stuff is so important, you know, especially, especially at that period of time in high school, uh, finding good instructors, which of course is not the usual, you know, kind of case a lot of times. Uh, public school is, is such it's a delicate matter. Um, I'm, of course, glad I'm not in public education. It would be, I, I think it would be interesting if I was. In actuality, I'm, I'm doing something on Monday. This coming Monday at a, at a high school, I'm doing a talk uh, at a local place about half an hour from where I live in Pasadena. And it's a college I did, it, uh, not a college, a high school. I did a, a talk at years ago before the pandemic. And the art instructor there knows of me. He, he, he's seen my work and stuff like that. So he contacted me asking if I would come out and maybe volunteered and, and talked with some of those kids and had their auditorium presentation, which I had done so. So he contacted me recently in the last month asking if I would come back for the next, you know, kind of round of high school kids. And I haven't done this with them since, since the closure of stuff. But now that they're back open and um, kind of engaging with things, they, they, he asked me if I would come back into it. So this Monday, I actually have a, a talk with high school kids. Um, 
So that kind of stuff, like I said, I think leaves an impression when you meet instructors in certain ways. Like him, he seems to be very close with his students. And it's, again, it's a public high school. Um, and he does a pretty good job of, of engaging, I think, what these students are doing. So in that situation, in those cases, I would always come back and support, you know, as much as I can. Anyways, here, here we have our Batman based on this pose. Yeah, Trevor, if you had seen somebody from the design industry back in high school, yeah, it probably would have been different in your decision making and what you wanted to do. And that's the case within this, which is so frustrating at times that you look back and think, if I just had that, you know, that one thing, um, it probably would be different today. And that kind of thought can become a little bit poisonous. So you have to be careful a little bit. Not to say that you can't think back and like, oh man, yeah, I can learn from this and move forward on it, but you don't want to get hung up on it, you know? Um, because when I when I hear that, it's like, I completely agree. It, it probably would have been different for you, you know? And I, and I know this mainly because of my own experiences. I was given those opportunities, which is why I say I was very lucky. I was very fortunate to have those, not even experiences of instructors, but also like just certain events and things that would happen in my youth that not every kid out there is going to be able to experience at all um when i was in high school you know i went to a public high school but that was also art centric it was an art magnet high school but uh, i lived up in in portland oregon you know this is up in uh, near beaverton is where the, the the place i lived at and in that area is where nike is that's where nike's uh, main campus is located so in one i think it was, it was one i think it was like maybe junior year something like that uh, Nike came in and they did a talk at our high school <clears throat> in one of our classrooms, but it wasn't a talk. It was also an actual, like, almost like a workshop. Uh, there were a couple of individuals that came from Nike. I don't know who they were or where they came from. I don't have no memory of it anymore. I wish I actually was able to keep some of that contact information to this point, but I don't have it. Uh, but in any case, they came in and they were talking about Nike and the programs, what they do there, but they also did like in an in-house workshop of design. They had like printouts of like this football figure with the like color and add things like branding and logos and stuff to it and uh, we were doing it in, in in the classroom while they were there so it was, it was very creative but also centric to the idea of industry and, and design within nike and outdoor wear and so through that event um the instructor got me and one or two of the friends to actually go visit nike they invited us to come out as a shadow so it was a one-day art shadow, basically. They would go out and have us walk around and follow them and see the internal like industry structures of Nike, what they would be doing. And they showed us all the different facilities and parts of how they would you know, actually develop uh, uh, sportswear, shoes to then clothing and performance. Um, I remember walking into the Nike campus and we went into one of our first, the first rooms, and there was a guy on a treadmill, all hooked up in like the oxygen tanks and stuff like that, running. And they were watching him. <laughs> it's like, what is going on? Uh, you know, but at first I had no idea what was happening, but of course you understand now it's like, you know, it's a part of research and performance, you know, testing and stuff like that. Uh, but at the time it was like, it was kind of weird walking into places like this. And I had no idea what the industry of, of sports were even was. Um, and that kind of stuff, like I said, exposed me very early on to certain elements of industry, even though, despite the fact that I didn't go into that field, but at a youth of a young age, I was given that, that chance to observe this, you know? And uh, it is a deep memory of something that I still I do remember to this day. Uh, and of course, you know, um, now being super into things like sportswear and sneakers and shoes, but also having gone to the school, you know, Art Center, where, where Nike, you know, since she established and came from. A lot of people went from Art Center to Nike. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the, if the kids or the people that were, you know, in my high school instructing those things might have been Art Center students themselves, you know. But that's the kind of thing that you can't necessarily predict or plan for. And it just happened that way. I was I was given that chance. Uh, I was in that right place. I lived in the location. You know, I was in the right time, and it just happened that way. I didn't ask for it, but you know, that's just how life kind of gave me those chances. But then I hear where other people like, man, I don't, I didn't have anything of that at all. You know, I had no instructors. I had no, no friends that even drew. I had no parents that were interested in what I wanted to go for. But everybody was telling me he's doing something else. You know, uh, I couldn't even imagine what that could have been. I guess I could, but at the same time, it's like. At the same time, when you're actually going through it, because you obviously can't look back, you know, or you don't, you don't know what the future would lie in, you would just do what you're told, you know, you just kind of move on thinking that that's what normal is. But as you grow older, you think, well, that's, this is what I could have been doing. You know, then that kind of regret sits in a little bit, you know, and that can become a bit depressive and kind of sad. 
And unfortunately, it's like, man, I wish I did have more of this kind of stuff. Now you feel like you're starting too late. Now you feel like it's not going to happen. Um, but, you know, don't have those kind of thoughts because there is no too late. What's more important is you start. That's really the critical thing, uh, taking that first step. Because it'll take time, obviously, to get to where you are or want to go to. It, it may not even really happen to the way you expect or, or, or imagine. But, again, that's not the point. The point is that you make the decision and choice that you take control of what you want to do in your life and the time that you have left over. Um, that's the part in which you lived in and have no regrets in moving to the future. And that makes you feel content. It makes you feel happier because you had the freedom to choose what you wanted to do. But at the same time, not everybody does either. You know, um, Other forces are against you. you know? And things that are not necessarily even people. It could be things like finances. You know? It could be your living situations. It could be where you are and, and other things like that. So it's unfortunate in those situations and again everybody is not dealt the same cards nobody has controls of that kind of stuff but all you can hopefully do is have um you know the assurance and the drive to go keep looking uh, and not have the fear to say you know that i don't think this is really for me i can't do it um and in that hopefully you do find the appropriate people you know you do find in the right connections anyways tough subjects For sure. I think that's a, a good way to approach it, Yusuf, in terms of that being um, a case where this is not just about having a career in terms of making a business and the money. That is an element of it, and it is a byproduct in a lot of ways as well, too, as in terms of financial security and that kind of stuff. But at the same time, of course, you know, the idea of this being a lifelong endeavor, that this is a lifestyle choice. This is about you of what you want to do in, in the rest of the time, that, as I said, you had, um, regardless of wherever you end up, that you'll still want to do it for the rest of your life. Because uh, I've made that decision very early on, and, um, not always by a conscious decision, but based on, you know, the, the continual habit of, of being involved in this approach. That it just kind of, that decision already has been made for you in a lot of ways, by your action itself. And the battering being flown off. Last night, I was going through a book. I still think it's probably one of the most insane projects, and that is of Akira, um, the animated movie, not the mangas. I mean, of course, the mangas are crazy, and those I'll look at, you know, every couple of months. But I recently bought this. Um, you guys might know of it, but they released these series of uh, Otomo collections, archives, and uh, two of the books are of the um, Akira storyboards. Oh my gosh, I was looking through those last night because I just recently got them. I haven't opened them up just yet. I saw him in the store, I picked him up. This, this, the, the guy, what he did in terms of like even not only the movie, but as a director and what he did for the storyboarding. I mean, he literally animated the entire film the storyboard. And I looked at the boards and was like, this is exactly what the film is. Like, there were no changes. It's like, they, the, the, Tori, oh, not Tori, I'm sorry, Tomo literally just drew all the storyboards and gave it to the animators. It's like, do this. And they just animated what he gave him because um, everything was problem solved through his storyboards. It was so crazy. Yeah, if you guys haven't seen that book collection before, um, I'll show you what they are. It's the Tomo. Well, the complete works. This one here. There's uh, complete works 21 and 22. And 21 and 22 are of the... Uh, Akira storyboards. He has other books out there. Um, they're numbered weirdly. I don't know what they mean, but this is a complete works eight. This is actually the reprint of his uh, one manga, the um, damn it, what the hell was that one called? Uh, I have it at the end of my tongue. Ah, whatever. It doesn't matter. Either way, um, 21 and 22 are the ones you want to look at as a, as a storyboarding. It's so good. Domo, thank you. But yeah, uh, I was I was just looking at the boards last night. I just wanted to like look through the books and analyze them a little bit and see his drawings. But I was just so kind of like taken aback of how exact those boards are to the actual animated film. I mean, they're they almost look like the exact same drawings as some of the animators were doing. They probably just took his boards and literally copied them. Um, that guy was so good. 
even the way he would problem solve camera movements, parallaxing and shifting the background, where the camera would move forward and where it would, all those little notes, even though some parts were in Japanese, uh, you can tell what he's intending. And it's, it's really, ever, for me, it was a really rewarding book. Even just flipping through it, I actually learned things from it just by looking at it. Um, but I just love his, the way he draws things too. He's able to capture a sense of like movement and explosion and effects and gravity uh, and also speed uh, in really amazing ways. So if you're looking for a really kind of like captivating but also inspirational uh, art book, Storyboards from Akira by Otomo, man, that one's a, a no-brainer right there for me. It definitely made me want to watch the movie again and definitely want to make me read the manga again. But the storyboards are, are it's almost as if he had redrawn the manga again, <laughs> essentially. You know, he spent all those years actually producing the manga, which is like, you know, six seven books right massive hundreds of pages per years to produce and then when he made the, the animated the movie i think he was you know, he was done with the manga at that point but he basically just redrew the entire comic again <laughs> through storyboard because each of the storyboards are not necessarily even like simple little scribbles some of them are like really well established pieces um really well planned out uh, tons of just information but yeah if you, if you know how to read um boards and, and through notes of like arrows and shifting of planes and stuff like that there's a, gr a great amount of stuff in there i would say a lot of um animated movies today from the western side storyboarding is not approached that way like they do in japan it's very different you know um i think from storyboarding in japan it, it derives so much from comics and mangas we're in the western field more from like hollywood production movies you know that kind of thing so it's a bit different in that situation which is why some of the drawing and the animated, uh, the, the animes and mangas are just so incredible. And you'll see that even with like uh, Miyazaki, you know, when he does his stuff with the Ghibli films, his storyboards are crazy. It, it could be entirely its own book on its own. Anyways, I'm just kind of pushing a bit more information on Batman here now. This is a fun one to draw. So you start to see again that direct influence from the pose into that iteration now. Uh, and that's, these are the kind of things I like to play with, right? Uh, where I would analyze these poses and sometimes I don't have to necessarily draw them anymore. As I look at poses, I'm able to collect what the pose is as a form, right? And I'm able to then use it as an archive of visual bank memory because I study, let's say one iteration of it. This posing right here is now in my head. I don't need this reference anymore to the future. If I want to pose anything similar to that one, I already know what to do with it, okay? And if I want to alter it, it's very easy to do as well too. Um, the shifting and turning of the camera, though, is challenging. But I do and will like, hopefully, like to see you guys take some of your guys' poses and play with it a little bit creatively. You can do whatever you want in terms of characters. If you want to do something like I did, like draw a Batman, go ahead. If you want to draw a Spider-Man, do that too. But And you can push it whatever creative ways you want to. Um, this iteration right now, I kind of went straight in, though. Obviously, you can see, I didn't necessarily build it. And you saw that I went from the head down. I didn't start from the torso. Because I was beginning with the overlapping regions. So the head overlapping the torso, torso overlapping the hips, down to those legs, into the arms. In the constructive iteration of things, I went with the torso for I'm drawing through all those regions. So then that connection of, of this to this seems a bit distant for some people. Like, well, how do I then go from constructing with torsos and forms and all of a sudden going to like the top layer and work my way down? It seems like a completely different technique and approach. And in reality, it is. It just is a different approach entirely. What this does, it gives you the visual memory of what that form and structure looks like from the angle of view and from that pose. That's all it's supposed to do. It gives you a visual reference, an inspiration of a guide. And so then you would use that as a way to obviously build memory towards and apply it to these kind of illustrated pieces, which are approaching in a very different way. So as I said earlier, the torso is something I like to use in construction and builds. But it also doesn't mean that that's the only way to approach even constructive manners as well, too. Some people go from the head and gesture, then they go to the torso, then they go to the limbs. Uh, some people go from other areas, but that's something that you can also be a bit more adaptable to and find different ways of approaching it and, and getting to the outcome. In any case, um, if anybody has any questions, let me know. Uh, if not, we're going to be moving on here real soon. I'm going to write down what the homework is for this week. Um, There's a show that Miguel was asking about, the Cyberpunk, yeah, I just watched it. Uh, it was really good at personally, yeah, really good personally, you think. 
uh, for the art style and animation. Was well, Studio Trigger? It was, yes. Um, when they announced the show for the trailer back before it was released, I was a little bit unsure because I do like Studio Trigger's work a lot. Um, but I was a bit like, eh, Cyberpunk? I actually like the game. I actually like the game a lot, actually, too. But for a brand like that in connection to Trigger, things like collaborative efforts like this never really can work out really well, you know? Because I always like what Trigger does on their own things, like their own original stories. Uh, Cyberpunk, you know, maybe should have been its own thing and left its own thing. So, exactly. So I was a little bit unsure about that, but I was very pleasantly surprised. It was a good animation. Um, and uh, Trigger, of course, you know, produces some fantastic stuff, and they hit it out of the park for this one as well, too. Uh, they did awesome. In terms of, sometimes also what happens is that a lot of animes and mangas, especially Japanese interpretations of things, abstract it really weirdly. So it has nothing to do with what the original source material is. Uh, for instance, I don't know if you guys watched that recent Star Wars or, or uh, the Star Wars animation kind of series, like shorts. They put on, I think it was on Netflix, too. But all these like different Japanese animations like did their own version of Star Wars. To be quite honest with you, I wasn't really that into it. There were some pieces that visually looked kind of cool, but it didn't really catch me because um, their their takes were just a little bit out there sometimes. <laughs> but that's shorts too. Shorts can be really weird. Um, but for this being a series, you know, uh, was like a ten episode series something like that. Uh, they they Trigger did a really good job with Cyberpunk. Um, and like I said, I actually liked the game a lot. When it first came out, I played it on PC. And of course, it launched horribly on consoles, which was a big controversy. But on PC, it played great. Uh, and I played it all the way through. I put a lot of hours into it. Um, and I liked the world. I liked the storylines. I liked the, the, the gameplay. I thought it was fun. Uh, it was actually, in my opinion, very immersive. I thought the design of the world and the city, uh, it, the capturing of Night City and how it basically what the animation did, the same thing, that's what I loved about it. Uh, the animation did a great job, not because of the character building the style, but it captured the feel of the city. It chews these characters up and it spits them out, you know? Uh, it, it's not a, a very happy story. It's a very horrible story, but that's what I liked about it. You know, they, they retain that feel that, you know, it, this cyberpunk is not about the characters. It's about the world and these people that live in it. Um, Night City is, is the character itself. So in the game, it, that's what you feel. And there were moments in the game when I played it, I felt like, wow, this actually was really immersive. There are moments that are like super quiet, some parts that are really energetic, super intensive, and you you can feel it in the game if you if you really get into it. But when you have a lot of like, I guess, pre-coded thoughts of what people are telling you, like, oh, it's a terrible game or it doesn't play very well, it kind of refrains you from experiencing it in a very positive way, which is why I tend to avoid things like reviews and you know forum talks and back and forth jargons on YouTube. I don't read any of this stuff because I know that. People are just spouting things based on their own opinions and areas that shouldn't influence your your own experiences, you know. Um, so when you guys you know come across entertainment mediums like this, this is why in the world today where people become very ravenous when it comes to things of consuming, but then also regurgitating and then going back and forth of spitting at each other's face kind of stuff, it's a horrible world right now that way within how people communicate, uh, especially online and especially within the world what we do, entertainment arts, uh, even like within techniques, AI art. People are just at each other's throats when I see people on Facebook. You know, when they, somebody posts it, everybody sh you know mentions the comments of like disappointment. You know, and even on Instagram, and they make comments like, "Oh, you too," or like, "Oh, I wish you weren't doing this." It's like I don't, I don't get that. I don't understand it. Um, people, yes, of course, have the right to to say what they want and have their own opinions and things, uh, but to downplay or to squash others is, is just not right to me. Uh, even if it is something you don't agree with and something that feel that you is not going to help. In some ways, um, but I, I don't understand that at times. And um, even with things like AR, I have no problem with it. People can do it whatever they want. And yes, there are a lot of ups and downs, as everything else has. Uh, but you don't know where it's going to be or where it's going to go. So to have so much fear behind what these things are, I, I don't understand. <laughs> you know. Um, but in any case, sorry, I don't want to diverge the topic too far around. We got to go into the feedback. So uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you guys haven't watched the animation, go check it out. It's a bit intensive in terms of um, story. It's you know got mature features, stuff like that. It's rated R, so you know make sure you are watching it with the appropriate crowd. So don't put your if you have a kid, don't put your kid in front of it. Um, like it happened to me when I was a kid. You know, I was put in front of Akira when I was like ten. So unexpectedly, and with no one 
in supervision. <laughs> so I watched Akira on my own as a young child. But you guys know that story, I think. All right, so let's go into the feedback. Uh, let me save this first, I don't lose it. No, oh, it changed me forever. <laughs> it, it, it completely altered my brain, I think. Um, yeah, I don't know if I told everybody, but my aunt rented Akira. This is back in the 90s on a laser disc. Laser disc of all things, mediums. Laser disc was a great medium, by the way. Um, I was visiting here in LA uh, as a kid. My parents had to leave for some kind of errand, and they left me behind at the apartment because that's what back in the 80s and 90s they would do. <laughs> they would just leave your kid behind the apartment, and they put on Akira and they left. And then I was sitting there just watching the entire thing, and it melted me essentially. <clears throat> so let's see here. Um, let's go to the roll sheet. <clears throat> 